best people, the best conversations. We're on a journey and it's just getting started. All right, everybody, we are back. It is a Jack Murphy Live show. I am Jack Murphy. We are live today with two of the top warriors out there in the world fighting the good fight for us every single day. Where would we be without these two guys? James Lindsay and Christopher Rufo. Gentlemen, how are you doing today? James, how are you? I'm great, sir. How are you? I am fantastic. Christopher, what about you, buddy? Also doing very well. I'm so glad you guys could join me again here. We've been working on the schedule to make this happen. Everybody's super busy. Thank you very much, both of you, for taking the time. As I was preparing for this show, I'm writing all these things down, studying some old documents, and, and putting you know an outline together. And then at 10 o'clock today, we get this. We're going to start with this, guys. Let's see how this goes. Play. And on September 13th, during that week, we'll begin inspections and enforcement. So we want to give businesses, big and small, a chance to get acclimated. We want to make adjustments based on their input. But this will move forward starting in the week of August 16th. And then full enforcement and inspection begins the week of September 13th, which is very pertinent because that's the first full week after Labor Day when we really expect a lot more activity in this city. Now, I'll tell you, we know those conversations with the business community are crucial. We've had a lot of them already. What we're hearing from so many folks in the business community is they understand it's time, but they need government to lead. That's going to help them to do what they need to do. Not everyone's going to agree with this. I understand that. But for so many people, this is going to be the life-saving act that we're putting a mandate in place it's going to guarantee a much higher level of vaccination in this city. And that is the key to protecting people and the key to our recovery. That's why it's the key to NYC. The key to NYC pass opens a lot of doors and we need it. We'll be issuing a mayoral executive order and a health commissioner's order. Those are the legal tools necessary to implement this approach. And we know that this is what's going to turn the tide. And we also know that people are gonna get a really clear message. If you wanna participate in our society fully, you gotta get vaccinated. You got If you wanna participate in our society fully, you gotta get vaccinated. Holy cow, guys. Has this whole thing just escalated to the next level all of a sudden? What's your first reaction? Because then we're going to put it in the CRT lens and see how we get through that. James, what's your first reaction to this, buddy? Don't get on the train, Jack. Don't <laughs> get on the train, Jack. <laughs> oh, this is this is the train to the gulag. This is, ab this is the train to something. This is exactly what we should not be doing, <laughs> obviously. And it's very, very clear that... that I mean, this is exactly what we should not be doing. Enforcing this kind of thing is, is inimical to the in, entire principle of the United States. If people, it's also inimical to science, by the way. You actually want to be able to know whether things are working or not, which requires you to have groups that have different treatments. Even if you're not doing an experiment, you still want to have different groups. So this is, this is just a heavy-handed tool that they're using to try to enforce something. Um, they haven't been exactly transparent at any point as to why. Uh, they say that this is going to save lives, but the data are not actually all that conclusive around that. They say that, you know, this is for our own good, but these people are going to tell us what's for our own good after this past year and a half. Um, they say that it's working in concert with the business community. Well, who and which people? And so we can stop frequenting those places. Uh, but the idea that that our society requires us to receive a vaccination when the most common response that I get to why is, well, Washington required it for smallpox, which turns out to be slightly more dangerous of a virus, uh, requires a lot more transparency and honesty than they've been giving us. So this is just, they think this is going to increase vaccination rates and it probably will. Um, but it's not going to increase trust in their authority. It's not going to tr increase trust in the vaccine. It's not going to increase trust in anything. And just wait till we get to the CRT side of this. So my <laughs> reaction is that, you know, this manipulation has been coming. This is another attempt to divide people. The vaxxed and the unvaxxed are going to be separated into two groups that are going to stratify society. They're going to get fighting over it. The scapegoating of the unvaccinated is about to begin full blast, including, by the way, it'll be unvaccinated people 
who have medical reasons why they shouldn't get the vaccine and unvaccinated people who have actually had the virus and therefore have at least equivalent, if not more robust immunity already and therefore shouldn't need the vaccine. It's just going to be a complete catastrophe. Yes, Mr. Christopher Rufo, what is your first reaction to hearing that news that just dropped at 10 o'clock today? Big time. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think that you have to look at it in context of the history of these uh, public measures. And uh, you have to go back, I mean, almost 18 months now to last February and then March. And it was originally, as you all know, kind of 15 days to stop the spread, this very new policy uh, of lockdown, which I don't think had been done ever before. And I think we were really pressured into it because China had done it. China said that they had done the lockdown, they had quashed the virus, um, which we, we don't know. We don't know if that's exactly right or not. We don't really have accurate information out of China. And then it was this rolling series of maneuvers with in, in and out of lockdown. And then it was really, we're just gonna do these rolling lockdowns until we get the vaccine. And when we have the vaccine, everything will go back to normal. And now the vaccine is out. We have pretty high rates of vaccination. Look, I, 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 I'm pro-vaccine. Uh, I got vaccinated. My family's vaccinated. Uh, the, the evidence that I've seen from my kind of layman's perspective uh, persuaded me that the vaccine is, is worthwhile, that it's effective, that it is uh, something that you should do, especially if you're over 50, especially if you have a uh, kind of obesity or diabetes or some other health condition. Um, but this was the deal that was essentially promised to us by policymakers. When the vaccine is out, it's out, you can get it for free. I actually just walked into a CVS and got it on the spot. It's available for free to anyone. It's out, have been, it's been quite a bit of time. And Americans can decide, do you want the vaccine or not? And the authorities and the public health officials should persuade Americans, if they believe, to get the vaccine to do it. But ultimately, we have a system where the individual decides his or her own risk, where some of you are not vaccinated, some of us are vaccinated. Um, that's the risk tolerance that you have. That's a decision you made. And I think, you know, good to go. We should be fine. And now we're getting vaccine passports. Now I think in the fall, I, I feel more and more persuaded that there's a good likelihood that we'll go back into lockdown, at least in certain places. And then this all begs the question, where does it end? Um, you know, I, and I think people have complied over and over. And I was at the uh, gym yesterday and uh the 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 owner of, of my gym is uh he's one of us he's very conservative uh, uh the guys were uh you know uh at, at the gym are, are on the same page and he said hey look uh i did it last year um but i i opened and i didn't shut back down in the fall he's like i'm not shutting down ever again uh because if if, if, uh, if those of us who made the sacrifice lost huge amounts of revenue uh struggled just to get by Another lockdown is I'm just going to shut the door, walk away, break my lease, leave the sell the equipment, and I'm done. Um, and I think that we have to listen to those folks. And, uh, you know, Citibank and Mayor de Blasio's office and all these people can ride out these consequences. But the guy who's running a, a gym or a falafel stand or a, a very small business, um, these things matter. And these things are destroying uh, their ability to provide their freedom. Uh, their rights and um, and look whatever you whatever your personal decision on the vaccine is um, the vaccine changed the game the pandemic is essentially uh, 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 at the point where we've we've been promised things would change and I think they should live up to it. Indeed, uh, I can get a sense out there that there's a little bit of pushback. So, for example, in D.C., they reinstituted the indoor mask mandates. We, I, I'm not exactly sure if it applies specifically to restaurants in D.C. It's so unclear because Mayor Bowser, she's implementing these mandates and then showing up at places indoors without a mask. Now, I went out to eat. And everybody in there had a mask on. Everybody there's the, there's giant signs on the door. Must wear a mask. I just walked right in. Nobody said anything. Nobody said anything for the rest of the night. And I saw a couple of other people. So doing the same thing. So I wonder if the if the uh, the enforcement team, right? Because who's been the enforcement team for these things? It's been it's been us. It's been the hostess. It's been the manager. It's been the people in fear of getting fined. So they've been enforcing it citizen on citizen, which was one of the yeah. things that I was opposed to in the in the first round, which was don't make a 20 year old girl 
tell you a grown ass man to comply with this thing that, that has been <laughs> mandated for everybody, right? Like don't put her or, or, or some line worker or just an innocent bystander in the yeah. conflict position of having to police you. But at this point now, it's been a year or more and man, I am over it. Lots of people are over it, but it's, it's convoluting people's perceptions. Uh, James, I noted that you had a little bit of an exchange with the reason folks and the libertarians, what has the libertarian, what has happened to the libertarian perspective on this? Is there a libertarian position on these matters that makes any sense to you? And then we're going to get to the CRT angle because it's fascinating to me. You know, I've lost all faith. And I mean, it's hard to say what is a libertarian, right? I don't mean to be philosophical, like they all disagree with one another, um, which is great, because they kind of should philosophically speaking. But, uh, you know, the idea, though, that, uh, I don't even know how to say this correctly. So the tiff was, I guess, between me and Robbie Sov, if I've said his name right, I'm not quite sure how his last name is pronounced. But he said that he would much, 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 much. I, I don't know how many much is he used, like <laughs> nine on Twitter. Yeah. Rather have a vaccine passport than have to put a mask on again. And then he told me later that the reason is because he's already been vaccinated. So uh, the mask is more restrictive to him. And I was like, well, just don't wear one. And you know, how complicated is this? But um, that's if that's like what's in it for me because of the decisions I made and screw everybody else, especially we know the risk of, of, of a, of a mat or of a vaccine passport. When you start making, you know, there'd be some kind of a thing that you scan in your phone. If it was in China, it would be WeChat that allows you to participate, get into venues, spend money or not, et cetera. When you start to slip into that, the Chinese, they slip that social credit system right into that system. People are like, oh, wow, I can pay with my phone. And the next thing you know, they're like, why can't I buy a plane ticket? It's been in operation <laughs> for two or three years before anybody knew it was being used on them. And so you know where, like they know where they're going with this. This is just an invitation in that direction. So to, to see libertarians go completely blind on that because they don't want to do something that they probably don't have to do Anyway, and if they do, we just listen to them for a year, yell at us that it's, well, it's a minor inconvenience. Shut up and wear a mask. Okay, it's a minor inconvenience. Shut up. <laughs> and they don't work anyway. Like, so what the heck? So, you know, this is what people aren't, you know, tiff about, you know, vaccine passports or whatever with people from reason or libertarians aside. This is what people don't understand is the vaccine passport is a grotesque infringement of the most worrying kind on civil liberties that we've probably faced in the history of the country. And it opens the door to a cascade of things. And people say, oh, well, that would be unreasonable. Guys, That I explained last night even on Twitter to somebody, and then Robbie Solov comes out and does this. It's like, this has been a plan, is to get people all along, this has been a plan to open the door to getting people to argue for the vaccine passport because they know how psychologically people will, oh, I got vaccinated, therefore... No problem for me. We've heard this argument a million times in a million other domains, which is, you know, um, well, if you're not afraid to get arrested, just don't break the law. I've already been vaccinated. Therefore, I shouldn't vaccine passports. No big deal. They knew that thousands or millions of people would start making that stupid argument if they got lots of people to be vaccinated because a lot of people are apparently not very principled. They don't understand the possible. They're not thinking consequentially. And I tell you, if we slip into a social credit system, which this thing is a backdoor for, I'm not saying it's a guarantee that that's what it's going to. I do know that that's the purpose of it, but it is a backdoor to it. And if we slip into a social credit system, we're not getting out of this easily. There is no pretty way out if we go to a full social credit system and the vaccine passport enables it and de Blasio's pushing exactly that plan. He's going to give us a key to freedom in New York city in the United States of America, where your key to freedom is called the constitution and the bill of rights. Like what? No, I'm sorry. This isn't how this works here. It was, it was uh, an argument that I had. It was an argument to make before that we were experiencing a corporate techno fascism. Right. And now it is appearing that we don't even have to like put the pieces together <laughs> and like make an argument for it. It's actually just sort of right out there in your face. Chris, were you ever a libertarian? <laughs> and what is what is oh, your dude. what is your take? What is your take on the way that this is challenging libertarian concepts and people's reaction to it? Well, you know, I, I will admit it. Uh I gotta be <laughs> honest. I did at one time consider myself a libertarian. Um uh, and, and look back on, on it with, with a certain sense of embarrassment about it, because um, the I think what happens with a lot of people in 
big cities who might be conservative, but they live in D.C. or New York or San Francisco or Seattle. It's very comfortable to be a libertarian because you say, well, I'm a, I'm a libertarian. I'm not one of, you know, one of one of the right wingers. Uh, it's an identity niche uh, that I think because it's non-threatening to liberals because uh, they know libertarians political power. Um, <laughs> it, it's kind of like a, a, a cute affectation that you can have that is a safe identity. Um, and uh, I, I, I think even I, I probably un unconsciously at the time kind of fell into that for, for, for some of those reasons. Um, but, you know, I think the libertarians, especially in the last few years, have just been on the wrong side of every issue. Um, I mean, they're on the wrong side of big tech. They're on the wrong side of uh, CRT. They're on the wrong side of vaccine passports. I mean, it's like libertarians have lost a basic sense of what human liberty is for. They've, they've kind of retreated to a set of orthodoxies that end up actually, they sound superficially libertarian but they end up actually uh, supporting this establishment authority, whether it's the right of public school teachers to shove CRT down the throats of kindergartners or, or the right of tech monopolies uh, to silence, censor, and, and, and exclude people uh, based on their uh, political views from the new public square, or whether it's something like, uh, like Robbie, who, who I like, I think he's a very nice guy, uh, but I mean, there's nothing less libertarian than a vaccine passport. I mean, it's like, uh, <laughs> it's almost like the, the acrobatics that it takes to even justify that on libertarian grounds is absolutely astonishing. And I think it's really just boils down to, well, this is convenient and this is cool. And I think what I've learned about a certain set of, let's call them center-right liberals or center-right libertarians, center-left liberals, this kind of centrist clique uh, in the middle of our politics that we see, especially on Twitter, is that um, they want all the benefits, the social and prestige benefits of, of appearing to be a contrarian, uh, but they're contrarians that actually don't take any risks. Uh, they don't take any positions that would actually transgress elite orthodoxies. So what they have is this kind of perfect posture, nothing more than a posture, that is neighborhood cachet. I mean, uh, it's 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 uh, transgression without transgression. It, it's kind of the appearance of it, and uh, and I think libertarians are are very helpful for all of us in that sense because uh, they 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 kind of mark the line of 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 respectability, and, and then they <laughs> give us a sense of what line we need to cross in order to venture into the unrespectable, which I think is essential at this time. Uh, to, to, to cross that line. Indeed. And I think, James, uh, you've done a great job of obliterating the sense of respectability, <laughs> uh, especially with your discourse. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we hadn't had a chance to talk since you really took that initiative on Twitter. I got to say, I commend you for it 100 uh, percent for just going out there and lay, putting the balls out there, just throwing it all out there. It doesn't matter. We have to we have to break all those rules of respectability and all the confinements of oh proper language and how to talk about things and whatever else. And so I commend you for that. I, I was right there with you and uh, I appreciate that type of exercise, James. So for anybody out there who was thinking that he was crazy, he definitely was not except for the Cathy's and you know, who's and all those people out there. Well, dude, dude, you need to thank the critical race theorists for this partly at least. I mean, there are other, I mean, I just am what I am. <laughs> I'm not going to change, but um, can't stop. Won't stop. Uh, right. But the fact is that I realized that respectability was something that the that the woke left, if we want to call them that, is manipulating um, to a very effective and very powerful degree, was in reading their own literature about respectability politics. They're always complaining about, oh, this respectability politics. And what they're saying is, oh, well, you won't let us use emotion. You won't let us throw a fit, blah, blah, blah. You tell us we have to be civil. We have to make arguments. We have to present evidence. We have to do all these you know, responsible things. Responsibility is white supremacy culture. That's just respectability, politics, blah, blah, blah. And I have adopted a very um, you know, controversial view, but I believe that the vast majority of what I read in the, the critical literature is projection. It is almost all confession, I, iron law of woke projection. I say it all the time. There's so much there. So you start thinking, how could this possibly be projection? Maybe you're wrong and maybe it's not, but how do you just look at it for, you know, a day? How could this be projection? And then you realize they're utterly obsessed with making sure their opponents stay within the respectability sphere. 
that they don't say anything too wild. They don't say anything too crazy. They don't ever fear monger. And what kinds of things do they go berserk about on Twitter that don't seem to, it, it, of course they go berserk if you say certain things, but if you, there are some things that it doesn't make sense that they go berserk about. And it's like, they're, they're giving you some clues and they want everybody that's opposed to them to stay respectable. And in this kind of, like both hands tied behind their back and one of their their legs cut off position while they get to just go berserk and do whatever. And if you call them out on they're going berserk, you're enforcing your respectability politics on us. Well, of course, they're just telling you how they think. They're obsessed with making sure their opponents stay in the sphere of respectability. And I don't think we need to go too wild. There is an art to being wild here. Uh, but you do have to not be bound by that. It is a set of chains they are putting on people. They have the respectable opinion. They have they have to look smart. They have to not. They have to do what what Chris was kind of referring to. I've called it for a number of years the, the centrist virtue signal. Like you have to like both sides it a little bit. Like yeah, well the right wing is also crazy bubble. You have to give the little centrist virtue signal. While you, it's, it's just a set of chains that they are very effective at putting on their opponents so that they can't fight back effectively. Indeed, Chris, uh, are you shackled by respectability these these days, sir? <laughs> I don't know. You guys will have to tell me. I mean, I, I, I try to, um, I try to approach the issue substantively. I try not to uh, provoke just for the sake of provoking. Um, but I think that if you read the press coverage about me in the last few months, uh, certainly uh, I am poking these people right in the eye. I mean, even the the Washington Post had published uh, ten articles in the past two months, uh, singling me out by name and uh, attacking me. Uh, which is a lot. Uh, and I think that the reason is because, uh, as James is talking about, I'm going right at one of their soft spots, one of their, one of their uh, kind of, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going right after them in a very direct manner. And I think what James is talking about is that you force, they're forcing people to attack them around the edges, to attack them uh, it, with a kind of gloves off or with a both sides kind of touch on it. Um, and Whereas I've gone just straight at it and I've used many of the own, their own techniques. So I've used Gramscian techniques. I've used uh, kind of critical techniques. I've used the linguistic techniques of critical pedagogy. Uh, and you turn them against their own ideology and then use their language of subversion to subvert their own concepts. And uh, I, I think, you know, James is a more versed than Hegel, but I think this would be the negation of the negation. Uh, that they that that uh, that that Marcuse famously talks about, and I think that this has just made them insane. And and James and I have been really tag teaming on this because James is really the theory expert. I mean, James is an encyclopedia of theory, connecting all the dots, laying out the case, making the kind of creating this great content to guide all of us into this world. And then I think I come in as a complement to what James is doing, really following his lead with the praxis or the practice, um, which is translating the theory into the realm of practical politics and then translating this kind of esoteric knowledge into knowledge that, you know, that school moms uh, and, and school dads can use at school board meetings and hammer their uh, school boards with. Uh, and I think that together we've, we've really done something that I, I think hasn't been done before to this extent. And this is starting to be recognized by many people. Yes. Uh, that we are going after them at the theoretical foundations and going after them in a direct front on attack that is working, that is demonstrating results, that is making accomplishments. And we're not getting lost in the web of, of, of status seeking and kind of prestige hoarding uh, where people, a lot of the people on, on, online are really they're having political arguments in order to cement their own identity, in order to cement their own status, in order to get accolades and popularity. Uh, and what James and I have done to a large degree together uh, is we've actually chalked up victories. So James and I testify before state legislatures. James and I advise parents that are getting this out of school boards. And now we have nine states have banned critical race theory in public schools. That's protecting about 75 million citizens. Um, and we have now laws introduced uh, in, uh, in the House, in the Senate, aren't, aren't going to pass now, but when there's a change of power, they will pass. Uh, and then we've had school boards getting overturned uh, all over the country, even in my 
I live in deep blue Washington state and I saw the news uh, yesterday that I wasn't involved in it, but actually the school board voted 5-0 in my local area in Washington state to ban critical race pedagogies uh, from the district. So this is a movement that is not merely about uh, kind of posturing or kind of intramedia fighting. Uh, this is actually about getting results and actually pushing back against the, 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 the supporters of these theories. Uh, in a way that actually wins. And I think that's what's really uh, made them go insane uh, and attack uh, both James uh, and me. Yes, congratulations yeah, uh, to both of you guys on that. I'm going to jump right in for a second here. Congratulations to yeah, both sure. of you on that. James, on the theory side, I mean, just a tremendous amount of work. And in fact, it may be the most thankless and sickest part of this whole effort because you have to literally study and immerse and read and synthesize and try to make sense out of all this nonsense and really it's truly nonsense and then when you just literally repeat their words back uh you get called all kinds of terrible names um but from my perspective you know i like to see uh our actions that we take with liminal order and my twitter feed and just our whole approach is to just try to equip regular people with like the skills and the ideas and the values that they need in order to just live a productive life in this environment, right? I've got you defining the theory and calling it out. And Christopher, you're, you're working on policy and getting things banned. And I'm over here just trying to like say, guys, this is how we're going to live. This is how we're, what kind of values we're going to need, what kind of organization and community we need, what kind of networks we need and things to advance in a positive way. Uh, I've tried very hard to not be defined by what I'm against rather than what I'm for. And so we're trying to put forth positive values and try to make things move forward from our perspective. So all, all together, and it's a huge effort, uh, everybody working yeah. on it, uh, we're definitely making progress. And uh, I wanted to, the segue is nicely into the next question that I had for you guys, which is what phase of this fight are we in? And what is the next phase? So James and Christopher, both of you guys, I've seen you put in the legwork, the foundation work to set up the machine that you guys have built to set up all the, the, the balls that are in motion. Now they're in motion. Things are happening. So at this point, it's like, okay, this storyline, as it were, is going to continue to play out. What is the next phase? after maybe we get some more success in policy, maybe there's more awareness on theory and what it really means. We get people to say the words out loud of what it really is. What, what comes after that? Because there's going to have to be a next phase. And I'm wondering if you guys have thought about that, where you see this going and, and what are your thoughts on, on where we are on this in a year or two or three or five James? Well, I, I mean, that's a tall order, but I would actually say that if we were to draw a World War II metaphor, that, that D-Day has occurred, we have taken the beach, we have established a front, but we have not, certainly not won the war. In fact, we haven't taken back much territory, but we have established a beachhead. We have established a front to fight this war. This is a, it's very actually helpful to think of this as a sort of world war that's being fought on a cultural level rather than being fought with guns. And we are at that kind of position. Now, the, having established the front does not guarantee victory. But this is what I started to say before we kind of segued in a, just to touch on it is the fact that, you know, people are doing substantive work is where all of this is going to matter. So what I see going forward as far as the next phase is, the stuff that's happening now has to continue. We have to keep laying out enough of the theory so people can cure the disease through understanding rather than kind of blindly. We also have to keep doing the substantive institutional kind of, if to call it that work that, that Chris is spearheading so effectively, where we're getting the legal changes. We're getting um, lawsuits filed around those legal changes. We're getting people showing up and trying to take back actual institutions. It's not going to be enough to rip every kid out of school that doesn't. That parents don't like this. We're actually going to have to try to get some institutional uh, footing back. And so those things need to be continuing. Um, that said, what we also have to do, and this is where what you just said about your own work, Jack, is really helpful. We have to understand that institutional, the, the left, the dialectical left, I'll be very specific about which left I mean, the dialectical left, if we might call the woke and the communists kind of collectively by that name, 
are extremely good at taking any institutional change that you possibly can think of or make and then twisting it back around to their advantage. So these institutional changes that are absolutely necessary, they must continue, are only one part of a bigger story. And the cultural change where we start, whether it's waking people up and teaching them how to live in this environment, reinstilling proper values that forward things like truth and beauty and excellence and, and liberty and responsibility, the, you know, the kind of anti-woke merit, you know, caring about competence, the kind of anti-woke Lit litany of values, that cultural change is going to be a big one. So this is a thing that I've just started in the past month or so. I did it in my Tampa workshop I had uh, last week, and I gave a couple of little talks about it. Um, I even mentioned it at Turning Point, but I think it wasn't, the audience wasn't the right audience for it. But is it, you know, we have to start cultivating what we might call a common sensibility. And I think this is extremely important. A common sensibility about what is sensible in life again. Right now, the intersectional sensibility, which Marcuse you know, kind of predicted with his new sensibility in the essay on liberation that he talked about. The intersectional sensibility that we are currently shifting into, what, what Wesley Yang calls the successor ideology on the ground, is thinking about identity and thinking about power dynamics in terms of everything. You don't know if something is true or false until you know who said it and what skin color they have. You don't know if something was good or bad until you know what skin color the person has. This is what we're going to do, the critical race, haha, ha, Bill de Blasio, who's now going to literally institute a Jim Crow, Jim Crow policy because minorities have the lowest vaccination rates in New York City. But hey, screw it. We're, let's just exclude them from society anyway. That's a critical race analysis that will come sooner or later when they stop milking power out of the vaccine passports. So what we have to do is we have to get out of this fractured, intersectional, identity balkanized sensibility where where who you are in relationship to so-called systems of power means everything. And we have to get back to a common sensibility. And that's where those values, truth, excellence, excellence is for everybody. Truth is for everybody. It doesn't, that's the definition of truth is it doesn't matter who says it, it's still true. Excellence is for everybody. Merit is something anybody can aspire to and achieve. You know, responsibility is something literally anybody can take to climb their way out of dependency. So getting back to a common sensibility where we see the world on common terms, we understand ourselves in common language, we don't have this crazy nonsense jargon and, you know, manipulated language where diversity doesn't mean diversity, means conformity and inclusion actually means exclusion of people you don't want there. Like we have to get back to a common ground when I'm saying a common sensibility and kind of direct refutation of, of Marcuse, which by the way, Kimberly Crenshaw in her paper mapping the margins even and many times since has referred to intersectionality. She says it's not so much a theory, it's more of a sensibility. It's more of a sensibility. Marcuse is saying we need a new sensibility if we're going to get liberation, in other words, communism of his new neo-Marxist flavor of communism. And so, no, direct refutation of that. We're going to have a common sensibility in the United States and throughout the West and hopefully broader throughout the world where we understand one another as human beings who are interested in truth, who flourish through excellence, who, who where merit matters and minimizes corruption, where taking responsibility is seen as a path to exiting dependency rather than smashing the system that you believe is making you dependent when you could actually just take that individual action yourself. These common sense, common sensibility type mentalities, I think that's a huge next phase because if we shift the culture and we learn, as you said, how to live in this stupid environment and we shift the culture, then these institutional changes get solid legs under them. So the laws stick. The laws mean something. The jurisprudence that follows them is sensible, again, in a way that, that keeps them from being twisted around by this dialectical evil that we're, we're having to deal with. Chris, what do you see as the next phase here or comments on that? You know how it works. Chris, floor is yours. Go. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree with James. I think the common sensibility is important, and I think it also requires us to have a common uh, sensibility about the country. What is the purpose of the country? What, is, uh, what are the kind of principles of the country? What do we, where do we want the country to go? And I think that um, that is going to be very difficult uh, to do, but I think is ultimately very important. And I think if we're to take the critiques of critical race theory seriously, and I think we should, I mean, it's not all uh, terrible. It's not a joke. I mean, some of these criticisms are serious and some of them are even uh, valid, even if their conclusions are totally uh, uh, invalid. I, I think we need to figure out what do we mean by those kind of the, the, the tension between freedom and equality. Uh, what do we mean by freedom in the 21st century? What do we mean by equality in the 21st century? How do those principles go together? Where do they conflict? Where can they uh, harmonize? And we do need to present a new vision of those principles. We need to renew those 
timeless principles for our actual specific uh, time and place. So I think there's work to be done there on a sensibility, on a philosophy, on a, on a uh, kind of national identity. But I also think that the next step, at least in, in my view, something that I'm going to be working on very hard is how do we reshape institutional power in our country? Because we need to understand that critical race theory is a is 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 an ideology that is that is inherently self contradictory. Uh, it's an ideology that is anti capitalist. It's an ideology that is uh, kind of anti American in the sense that it wants to subvert the American regime. Uh, but it's also an ideology that was really subsidized and continues to be uh, uh, subsidized by taxpayer dollars. It's an ideology that only thrives in public institutions or institutions like private universities that are showered with public dollars through student loan subsidies and direct grants, et cetera. Um, so you get to the point where you have the critical race theorists that are invited to federal Department of Education conferences that work at state-funded university systems uh, that then implement their ideas in public schools and city government municipal agencies, where you have essentially a, a, an ideology that is completely subsidized to the gills by taxpayer money that opposes the values of the majority of taxpayers and wants to subvert the public institutions uh, in, in which it is embedded. So I think that we have both a blessing, a curse and a blessing here. The curse is that uh, these, these kind of radical minoritarians, philosophical minoritarians, representing a, a viewpoint, a, a kind of unpopular viewpoint. And even I should, I should emphasize, uh, Latinos and Asians who have an opinion on critical race theory oppose critical race theory by a two to one margin. Uh, this isn't a simple kind of white and people of color distinction. Actually, uh, every minority group polled uh, besides African-Americans who are much, a little bit closer to 50-50 opposes critical race theory by large margins. That's an aside. The main point is that uh, they've taken this ideology that represents a very small fraction of people um, and then used public dollars to subsidize it. Well, that's the curse. The blessing is what the public giveth, the public can take it away. So we need to come out with policies to basically say our public institutions are going to represent the broad values of the public, and we're going to go through and reshape, restructure, and decentralize power, decentralize money, decentralize institutions, so that it represents actual the actual people's viewpoints and priorities, not just these ideologues who've hijacked these institutions. That's going to be a, if you think our fight so far has been intense, uh, it's going to get much more intense when we start trying to take away their public money. <clears throat> I love the fact that you brought up common sensibility and creating a new energy, a new a new energy injected into the system. I've been doing a lot of reading on the American founding in Lincoln because I got the Claremont Lincoln Fellowship coming up next week. I've just been buried happily uh, in original texts. And one of the things I was really struck by was the fact that uh, they understood at the founding that the government that we've created required a certain type of citizen in order to make it work. A virtuous citizen, a moral citizen. John Adams very clearly said a Christian citizen, but we can leave that aside. Let's just talk about the, the morals and the values for now. Uh, and, and that they wanted to create public schools to teach children about the virtues of Republican uh, government so that they could be better citizens within the system. Lincoln talked about the need for a political religion, which is sort of the same thing, I believe, just this, this extreme patriotism to understand the value and the gift and the, and the miracle that we have of Republican government. Uh, and then Reagan talks about it again with his new patriotism. And in a way, James, I'm hearing the same thing from you in uh, the new you know, common sensibility. So actually, one of my questions here was, is where do concepts like political religion and new patriotism and these ideas from the founding about what type of person, what type of citizen do we need to make this Republican government work? You know, how does that play into our future, James? So just continue to expand on this thought because I think that we're, we're seeing this the same way here. Yeah, I really actually like what Chris just said too, just to be really clear in the way that he actually positioned it, that part of that common sensibility, because I hadn't thought to frame it this way, needs to be a common sensibility about what this country means and what 
uh, the goals of this country are, what direction we want the country to go, uh, what it means and therefore also to be a citizen of this country. And whether we call it a political religion or whatever, you know, um, fine. The, <laughs> for me, the view is, though, that there should be civic values. And I think that civic values are actually core to what a nation means. And it's not just, you know, a geographical area with borders, because what is if we go back just very basic, back to basics, what is a border? A border is a line, a political line on a piece of dirt that uh, indicates where one set of laws ends and another set of laws begins. And that set of laws should be reflective of the values of the people and the intentions and the goals of the people uh, within that political distinction. And so there's something very core to what a nation is that we do have to cultivate these virtues and these values. And this is where I, you know, I've been trying, I put out an article, a new discourse is a, I don't know, time flies a couple of months ago, maybe the values <laughs> of a post woke world. I specifically named ones that I've just referred to. I named truth and beauty, but I say that beauty is actually excellence, um, truth, beauty, excellence, responsibility, liberty, merit, um, competence. These are, are values, and there are others. I'm not trying to say that these ones that I named are, are exclusive, but these values are actually necessary. Understanding actually how a Republican system of government works, how it's supposed to work, why we have divided powers, why we don't rule by a series of large numbers of executive orders, for example, what the point of the entire American experiment was to prevent tyranny. Uh, and then following from that, using that engaged civic mindedness and citizenry to shape institutions in the exact way that Chris is talking about is what we need to be focusing on. So I do think it does take a certain kind of person though. It takes, and if we want to cut it to the simplest possible division, and this is, this is a work of a friend of mine is that it just has to come down to when you have a country that's a Republic, it comes down to the simple dis division of responsibility versus resentment. It's as simple as that. Do we cultivate uh, through our civic education or whatever it happens to be values of responsibility or do we lead people to go into resentment? And I see that very clearly, for example, when I read Paulo Freire's The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, he explains the situation of the peasants. He says this is the peasants, the peasants uh, are dependent upon the system and the system is corrupt and they are trapped in their dependency. And you can almost feel like that second where he's going to say they have to take responsibility for their own lives. Well, they would if they were you know, James Madison, but instead it's Paulo Freire. So he's like, so we teach them to smash the system that keeps them dependent. And that right there is the fundamental distinction. So having the values that cultivate an attitude of tending toward responsibility and taking responsibility in a way that's, that builds a better world and a better country, I think, and a better citizens, better individuals at, at that, for, for that matter, I think is absolutely necessary. I think you are correct in your reading of the founders that it does require somebody who's willing to align with virtues and that understands what the point of the polity is if we're going to have a successful republic. And that's why you have a republic, if you can keep it. <laughs> um, that, that's the threat. Chris? Yeah, I, I think... James is, is making an important point. And I, I also would just kind of caution us to, to be thinking about this now is that uh, we want to, I think we've struck an, a, a really strong opening shot. Uh, we've elevated a brand, critical race theory. We've exposed it using their original source text. We've done the empirical investigative work by laying out the damage it's doing to our institutions. We've connected it to actual practical politics where now everyone from school boards to uh, the most powerful senators uh, in our country have taken up this issue and are moving forward. Uh, but we need to now create a, uh, a, a policy platform and program to figure out how to translate these conceptual ideas, these uh, principles and philosophies and, and, and desires uh, into a, a kind of package where then very busy uh, state legislators and federal legislators and, and, and president of the United States uh, in maybe in 2024 uh, can actually take it as a ready to go package of, of what to get done. Because one thing we saw in the Trump years uh, uh, that President Trump won on a pretty clear mandate. I mean, his policies were very simple, but he had very clear policies. I think everyone knew what he wanted to achieve. Uh, but they got into office and then kind of 
face planted. They didn't have staff. They didn't have a vision. They didn't know how to work the bureaucracy. They didn't know how to wrangle the legislature. And then they essentially outsourced the policymaking process to kind of Reaganite Republicans who passed a big corporate tax cut, uh, which I think, you know, isn't really, wasn't really in line with Trump's core priorities, uh, took energy away from other uh, pursuits, and then uh, kind of really limited the actual achievements of his administration. I think we're going to be really honest about what happened. And then we need to learn from that. So we need to have a kind of plan. And I think one of the things that Heritage Foundation did, for example, in the late 70s, getting ready for Ronald Reagan was they they released like a thousand page policy book, uh, basically saying, here are all the areas of government. These are what we want to do. Here are the policy papers. Here are the implementation plans. Reagan got in there. His staff got in there. They said, well, well, this is a big, nice, uh, nice policy book. This seems like something we should do. And then boom, 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 boom. One, 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 two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They started getting it done, and I think that uh, you know we we also have to be thinking in those terms. Like, what is the policy playbook? And um, I, I think that's very exciting. And I think what we have the opportunity to do now is we have the opportunity to test, kind of A B test some of these policies in state legislatures. And I think one f- final brief point is that my vision and my hope is that uh, we can actually. Uh, revive this idea of pluralism in our country. Um, I don't want to impose my values on people in Berkeley or Brooklyn or, uh, you know, uh, wherever, someplace where the kind of political values are quite different from mine. I I, I want to protect their right to kind of pursue their own uh, vision, their own policies, their own ideas. But I also want to have the right to have in my community or, or, or someone else's community the right to do the same. So I think we need to really supercharge that American principle of federalism, of pluralism, of decentralized power, uh, so that the states look very different from one another, that the public school systems, even within a state, look very different from one another, um, and that we can actually have a kind of vibrant experiment, a vibrant uh, uh, democratic process where people feel invested in their local communities and people feel like they have some sense of control and autonomy over their institutions. Well said, both of you guys. Uh, I'm looking to find my part in this. And again, it's leading people towards positive expression of positive values and living in a positive way. And we do that in the liminal order. We got 700 guys getting together, committed to each other to do the man's expectations of life, to, to live in a masculine way. And one of the things I ask the guys sometimes, I tell them, I've got, hey, I've got guests coming on. What should I ask them? One of the guys asked a really great question. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to ask it and then ask my version of it too. He said, what does a dialectical retreat look like for the CRT folks? I.e., is there a way for them to save face? I'm trying to figure out a way to have an end game. And, you know, if somebody doesn't have a face saving way out of conflict, well, then that means the decision tree is going to have to go in one direction or another. James, is there a face saving end to this conflict with the CRT folks and their vision for the future of America and their attack on all of the pillars of exceptional American exceptionalism, their destruction of the schools where we're supposed to teach patriotism to respect the Republican government that we have to respect the free market economy that we have private property rights being one of the most important things that we have. They're against all of those things. Is there a face saving way? that leads to an outcome, an acceptable outcome for us? Or is this Ricky Tiki Tavi, we're the mongoose and they're the cobra and well, you know how that goes. Well, I mean, it's really hard to have a face saving path out of, I want to destroy your country from within. But um, that said, there are actually a number of them. Um, they require, as all face saving, I guess, does when it's at this scale, a little bit of eating crow. Uh, which maybe they're not to want to do. We have to bear in mind also, remember, that woke is the resurgence of a face-saving project out of the liberationists in the 60s, which was neo-Marxism, it's a, which was a face-saving project of the cultural Marxism disaster that went through Central Europe after Lukács and so on, like tried to destroy Hungary, which is a face-saving project of the failures of Marxism, which was a face-saving project off of the failures of the young Hegelian progressive movement that preceded it. And Hegel maybe isn't directly responsible for what those 
who followed him in their zeal did with his ideas. So we have to be cautious with that. There has to be a degree of crow eating, but there are some paths. It's very, very simple to say a number of different things. One, they could very easily say, as Chris remarked, well, we had some critiques, those critiques attached to real problems. We were very invested in pursuing and continuing the noble work of the civil rights movement. We got caught up in something that wasn't the best way to do it. And we had the best of intentions um, and just got way out ahead of our skis. That's actually face saving. It actually is. We got ahead of our skis on a project that has good intentions is face saving. Another one is, I think, honestly, if you are just completely, if you want to read like critical race theory and read it to where it makes sense, the absolute simplest thing to do, and I don't mean to pick on anybody politically, this is also why I don't have a 501c3, uh, is to just replace everywhere it says white people with white Democrats, and it usually works. It usually simplifies. So what, what had happened, what, what has happened is that um, the so-called white liberal contingent that always gets called out within their literature is in fact enacting a lot of the bad policies. They, they think that they're helping when they're not. But again, that's that same face-saving thing. So it's, you know, what we were attaching too broadly, we, we saw a real problem and we blamed too many people for it. We overgeneralized. That was a mistake, but it wasn't an intentional destroy your country kind of mistake. That's face saving. So there are those kinds of roots, but there is still crow eating. You have to admit you went too far. You have to admit you got caught up in a cockamamie conspiracy theory that all white people exist to hold all other people down. That's the racial contract. You, that's part of their theory. It's a central idea. We got whipped up to the point where we were scapegoating by, ra by racial characteristic. I don't want to say by race because they scapegoat whiteness, not white technically, but they also say that there's no difference between being and doing where it comes to whiteness. All white people benefit from privileges that they cannot easily renounce. That's an exact quote from Barbara Applebaum. So um, there are face-saving ways, which are we got caught up in something that attached to reality, uh, and then we went too far with it. Another possibility, and this actually ties in with the institutional changes Chris was just talking about, is to point out that, well, we were just following, and this is gross, but you know, the incentives were there and people got caught up following bad incentives that were created, bad jurisprudence. For example, disparate impact as proof of discrimination is a bad incentive structure that encourages people to manipulate that through civil rights law. So the civil rights law becomes perverted. Um, that's those, that's another thing. They're, the incentive structures were bad. People were just following the incentive structures where they were, and we should just dr drop blame and correct the incentive structures and move forward the best we can. That's a safe uh, face saving thing. But where I said that, you know, woke is a, is a dialectical manipul It is, it's a dialectical synthesis of postmodernism and neo-Marxism. Uh, and then neo-Marxism is a dialectical synthesis of cultural Marxism and Hegelianism. And Cultural Marxism is a dialectical synthesis out of vulgar Marxism into the cultural realm. We don't want them to have a dialectical retreat. We want to stop the dialectical BS. And so I don't want to give them a dialectical retreat. I want to give them a retreat where they are not seen as necessarily evil, bad people, people who messed up. We did a big, giant experiment for 40 years, and it was a terrible Terrible idea, but the people who were involved had the best of intentions and they just got caught up in something that went really badly awry. So let's back up, take a breath, reconvene and do something different. That's what there is. There's no dialectical retreat here. Communism of all stripes needs to die. It will never work. Excellent answer. Chris, do you have any thoughts on that? How do we come to a conclusion that doesn't involve total annihilation? Or is that really where we need to go? <laughs> <laughs> ideologically yeah yeah I, I mean I, I sure of course yeah I, I think um well I, I think it's probably um probably naive to expect that there would be a kind of full retreat or that people would say I've recognized the error in my ways a lot of people are incentivized and paid and their livelihoods are dependent on uh, promoting this ideology and you have even corporate DEI according to a report that I just saw is a eight billion dollar a year annual business are they going to ever say well you know kind of overt racism in the workplace seems to be on the decline it's maybe time to like start winding down the DEI department maybe reducing the funding commensurate to the level of discrimination um, of course not uh, they're going to come up with more invisible and subconscious and subtle 
um, microaggressions, maybe going down to even the level of picoaggressions or whatever the, you know, whatever the metric system guides us to. Um, and so I, I think it's probably naive to think that they'll go in that direction. But I think James is right into saying that you need to give the majority of people the benefit of the doubt. I think most people who are bought into this, you know, not the not the hardcore people or the really originators of these ideas, but most people are just saying, hey, this seems this seems like a good thing. Some of the language resonates with me. Those people need to be educated, uh, need to be exposed to kind of what these things really do in practice, and then gently guided back to something more constructive. And I think there's also, though, uh, another dialectic that's that I'm particularly interested at play recently that you have uh, this actually kind of hilarious dialectic, um, uh, darkly hilarious, where you have uh, uh, this ideology, which is self-consciously presents itself as revolutionary. We need to abolish capitalism. We need to overthrow uh, the constitutional regime. We need to have a totally new society, a total rupture, as Marcuse put it. Um, but then it's, and, and you know, anti-capitalism is core to that, right? That's always been the dream. And yet, in the dialectical fashion, it's been absorbed into corporate life through diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and really, I think that the, 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 the kind of beautiful thing is that the revolution against capitalism has been then digested by radical consulting firms and sold back to Fortune 100 companies as anti-racist commodities. Uh, so, you know, you have that idea that you know, the revolution might not be televised, but the revolution will be commodified. I mean, it literally is sold in these like repeatable PDFs that have very high profit margins because the cost of replicating a PDF in the digital age is so low. You have, you know, this beautiful economic system. So anti-capitalism has now been absorbed into capitalism. Anti-Americanism has now been absorbed into America's public institutions. And I think that's like bad, right? This is like not a good outcome. But in a way, it shows the power of our institutions that it can even absorb something that is ostensibly and at the surface level opposed to it. Uh, I think that in a weird way, doesn't give me like, it's not like a great thing, but it does give me some level of hope that, that this kind of BS ideology can really just be absorbed, commodified, softened, and relegated to the unproductive sectors of corporate life the unproductive sectors of our economy and the public bureaucracies. Uh, and hopefully from there, then we can take the kind of, the kind of policy effort and then, then kind of limit and reduce how much we fund uh, these, these kind of destructive ideologies and then reorient our public institutions towards commonly held principles, towards a common sensibility and towards excellence, which I think we it really like, we want excellence. We want excellent schools. We want excellent achievements. We want excellent firms. We want excellent uh, results for our country. Uh, and I think that that is ultimately the direction that we can go. All subcultures go through a process by which they become commodified and co-opted by the dominant culture. I think we'll start getting a hint of that if you start hearing people say, well, you know, I was woke before the corporations picked it up, right? Like hipster wokeism, yes. <laughs> hipster wokeism would be a good sign of that happening. And uh, you make a really excellent point, Chris. I mean, when when your biggest corporations are flying the flag and talking the talk and walking the walk, it's not a subculture. It's not a revolution anymore. It is just part of it. And it will be interesting to see if the absorption digestion hypothesis will be enough to process it and expel it as waste eventually. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. So in the meantime, we all have to keep on doing what we're doing. James, thank you so much for all of the work that you have done, sir. And you continue to put it out. Tell people where they can find you right now on the interwebs, James. At Conceptual James is me. At New Discourses is my business, New Discourses. And the website is newdiscourses.com. Lots I, of cool stuff coming, so check it out. I love how you didn't go nonprofit on that as well. Uh, I can understand that. That's interesting. Not a 501c3, as you said, which is a limiting factor in many ways. Chris, where can they find you and how can they support you as well, my friend? Absolutely, yeah. The uh, Twitter handle is at Real Chris Rufo. And then you can visit my website, ChristopherRufo.com. Uh, I have a, actually a really awesome community of small supporters. Uh, love for you to join if you're interested. And um, yeah, keep, keep in the dialogue. This is great. I, Jack, it's been fun to 
check in with you every what six months or so. That's right. Um, yeah. And uh, I, w- I would love to go back and look at some of the original episodes when this first started <laughs> to see how it's developed. And uh, it's a valuable platform. And um, and I, and what you're doing is is just a, a great meeting point. And I think that's really valuable. You're a very social guy. You're a natural connector. You're a natural natural uh, kind of network builder. And I think that is a, 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 a key uh, a key resource for all of the people vaguely in our world. You're someone that can kind of bring them all together. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much for those kind words. I'm just a guy with a microphone and an internet connection. You guys are out there killing it. I appreciate everybody in the chats. Thank you guys so much, uh, especially thank you to Jennifer Law. Thank you so much. Guys, uh, share this. We got to beat the algorithms. You can't leave it up to YouTube and Twitter to promote it for you. Share it with your friends. Hit like, hit retweet, put it out on Twitter, put it out on Facebook. Follow these guys all over the internet. I'm Jack Murphy. This has been the Jack Murphy Live Show. Until the next time, thank you very much, everybody.